And now, I know that since you are mostly women, you're all curious to know something about your speaker. When I read over the list of her qualifications, I was simply amazed. In fact, I think it would boggle the mind to try to uh, keep track of all the things that she has done. She is an author. She has, uh, has authored, I believe it's nine books, and I have a copy here of her latest book, which is just now uh, on the press, <clears throat> and which any of you who want to buy, uh, she'll be very glad to autograph for you. She has been on TV. Well, I want to leave that for a minute. She's been on radio. She writes columns. And incidentally, she's a housewife and has six children, uh, all of whom she taught to read before they ever went to school. Uh, but the th uh, to come back to TV, some of you probably heard her the other night when she backed Bill, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Bill Buckley into a corner. Uh, that uh, especially was uh, delightful. And so now I know that you will have a very delightful uh, half hour uh, before you. And so I do want to introduce our speaker of the day, Phyllis Schlafly. Thank you very much for those kind words, Madam Regent, distinguished guests, and good friends. It's a very great pleasure to be invited to visit with you for a while this afternoon. And I would like also to thank my husband, Fred, for letting me come. I love to say that because it irritates the women's livers more than anything I say. I, actually, I can't complain about my husband ever interfering with my civil liberties. Every time we have an argument, he always assures me of my constitutional right to remain silent. <laughs> the phenomenon called the women's liberation movement has developed a certain picture of women, an image of women, which I believe was best summarized in an advertisement developed by the National Organization for Women and run as spot announcements on many television stations and as ads in many newspapers and magazines. This advertisement shows a darling curly-headed child and the caption over the picture is, this normal healthy child was born with a handicap. It was born female. Now this is the starting assumption of the women's liberation movement. That somebody, it isn't clear who, God or the establishment or a conspiracy of male chauvinist pigs, has dealt women a foul blow by making us female. And it is up to society and the Constitution and legislation to remedy these centuries of oppression, of injustice. And so they go about the country telling women that they've been kept in serfdom. That is a favorite expression of Congresswoman Martha Griffiths. They tell women that we've been oppressed for the last 200 years. They tell women that you're just second-class citizens in America. And worst of all, you're not even a person. Now, if there's anybody here today who is worried about not being a person, let me reassure you that back in 1875, in the case of Minor versus Happersett, the U.S. Supreme Court officially declared that women are persons and are citizens and entitled to all constitutional rights and guarantees except the right to vote, and we got that in the Women's Suffrage Amendment. So you don't need to worry any longer about not being a person. And yet they go abroad and up and down the country proclaiming this myth, the myth of the mistreatment of women. Now you may think that uh, this is so far removed from reality that we need not concern ourselves with what they're saying. But the women's liberation movement has had a tremendous impact on our society. It has had an impact in the educational system, an impact in the media, it has had an impact on our laws. It has had a tremendous impact on the institution of marriage, on the social structure in this country, and on the world. And so it is important that we examine 
what the women's liberation movement is all about and how it affects our society and how it affects you. The second dogma of the women's liberation movement is that of all the examples of injustice to women and oppression of women, the greatest is that women get pregnant and men don't get pregnant. And uh, obviously, if women are going to have their full equality, uh, their full fulfillment in our society, we have got to make them equal in the right and ability not to be pregnant. And that is why the women's liberation movement is compulsively oriented into abortion on demand, funded by the government, accepted by our people as just simply another operation like a tonsillectomy or an appendectomy. They see in this as the only way that women can achieve their full equality. And then the next dogma of the women's liberation movement is that the second example of oppression of our, of our women is that society expects mothers to take care of their babies. And this is so unequal, this is so degrading, this is so confining, so oppressive. If women are to achieve their full equality in our system, if they are to have their full fulfillment and identity as a person, then obviously they must be relieved of this oppressive burden of being expected to take care of their babies. And we must make child care the obligation of society, of the government, of the taxpayers, of anybody except the mothers, because it is so unequal. This is the rationale under which the Ohio Task Force booklet in uh, telling how ERA would be implemented in the state of Illinois came to the conclusion that the equality rationale requires us to establish taxpayer financed child care centers. This is to relieve women of what they see as this unfair burden of being expected to look after their babies. Uh, then, the, then the fourth dogma of the women's liberation movement is that there really isn't any difference between men and women except those obvious differences. And all those other differences that you think you see are just due to societal restraints and stereotyped education. And we're going to change all that by having a gender-free educational system. We're going to change all that by ending roles and ending stereotypes and giving equal funding to women's sports and all that sort of thing. They have worked themselves around into where they really think that if you gave the same money to women's sports in school that you do to men's sports, that girls would be able to play football and wrestle and box equally with men. They have worked around to where they really think that. Now, I don't think for most people we need to uh, go into much detail on the fallacies in these dogmas. As far as uh, your own self-image, uh, as the uh, ability to have babies or the obligation to take care of babies, it's a matter of your attitude toward life. Uh, most women, most mothers look upon the ability to participate in the creation of new life as the great privilege that God has given to women. This is something to be looked at in a positive way, not a negative way. And when you look at the, the task of taking care of babies, surely it has its drudgery, but it's certainly better than most of the jobs of the world. And you've got something to show for it after 20 years. You've got something living and breathing that returns your affection. Certainly a factory machine and a typewriter don't return your affection. You've got a new citizen that you brought into the world. In the matter of the, of the physical differences, to, to convince yourself that there really is a difference, you need only look at the Olympic Games. Here you have young women who have trained for professional competition from the time they could walk. And yet still the gulf of difference between what women can do and what men can do is so great that the women not only can't win any medals in competition with the men, they can't even qualify. Now there are a few sports like figure skating where grace and beauty is, is part of the game. The women do very well. But in your competitions of strength and uh, short-term endurance, uh, th there's just a tremendous gulf of difference between men and women. Take even such non-contact, non-strenuous sports as tennis and golf. If you take the ladies' tees off the golf courses, the women are out of the game. 
Take tennis. There is no way that the top women professional tennis players can possibly compete with the top male tennis players. A marvelous tennis player, Chris Everett, is only about as good as the 20th top male tennis player. There is that difference, and you simply are dooming yourself to a life of, of frustration and unhappiness if you fail to recognize these differences and then go ahead and start tackling life's problems. The women's liberation movement, based on their dogmas, have then developed five commandments to guide their tactics and what they're after in society today. Some of us may have ten commandments to live by, but they have developed five uh, which determine uh, what they do, their activities, and their goals. The first is that we must build a gender-free society. They want to make a society in which you are not permitted to have any reasonable differences of treatment or uh, assignment of one sex to a particular occupation and not the other, etc. They want to end stereotypes. Um, they want to induce role reversals in the schools so that uh, the, the girls and the boys will select uh, subjects and careers absolutely indiscriminately without regard to sex. Now, in order to do this, um, they have been going after the textbook publishers, thinking that if they reach the textbook publishers, they can very quickly change the educational system we have in this country. So they have convinced some of the major textbook publishers, such as Macmillan and McGraw-Hill, to issue new orders to textbook authors, eliminating what they call sexist words and sexist stereotyping in the textbooks. Uh, the examples I have are taken specifically from the Macmillan guidelines on the elimination of sexism in textbook. Uh, they, for example, uh, say you can no longer say chairman or salesman, it must be chairperson and, and salesperson. Uh, you cannot any longer say mankind, it must be humanity. You can't use the word brotherhood, it must be amity. You can't talk about manpower, it must be human energy. You can't talk about forefathers, it must be precursors. I remember one of the early debates I did on the Equal Rights Amendment, and I referred to the Founding Fathers, and she spun around and said, you see, you didn't say the Founding Mothers. And um, they uh, have, as an example of words you must not use, you cannot say man the sailboat, they don't give the alternative for that. I suppose it's person, the sailboat. <laughs> and then the guidelines for the illustrations are just as funny. You must show a man in an apron every time you show a woman in an apron. You have to induce the role reversals by showing father washing the dishes while mother works at her desk. You should show a little girls playing with snakes. You should sh show father using hairspray, and on and on. Uh, this is to blur the sex distinctions and to make children feel that there really isn't any difference at all between uh, men and women. Uh, to me, one of the silliest examples uh, was what they said about Sakajawea, who you will remember was the Indian guide who led the Lewis and Clark expedition. And as I come from that part of the country where the Lewis and Clark expedition began, this has always been a subject of con considerable interest to me. They singled out as an example of blatant, obnoxious sexism in a textbook the statement that Sakajawea was an amazing Shoshone woman. Now, Sakajawea carried her papoose on her back all the way from Wood River, Illinois, to Oregon. It really was an amazing feat. The sentence is obnoxious sexism because it perpetuates the myth of feminine fragility to call her amazing. So it really is too bad that children cannot be taught that she was amazing. She truly was amazing. The one of the most interesting parts of this guideline on sexism is the four-letter word that is now being censored out of textbooks. You'll remember several years ago there were some parents who wanted to get some bad four-letter words out of textbooks, and they were accused of censorship, 
Well, it just depends on which four-letter word you want to get rid of. The four-letter word that the women's liberation movement wants to get rid of is lady. And in the sexism guidelines, it says that this is a word which must be eliminated because it connotes ladylike behavior. Now, I think all this is really rather pathetic, but these are the orders going out to those who write textbooks. A generation or so ago, it was thought that parents were doing a good thing for their children if they tried to induce left-handed children to become right-handed. We don't do that anymore because we know it causes a lot of other problems. I think mixing them up as to whether they're boys or girls is just as hurtful to them. And uh, you, we talk about the younger generation searching for their identity. Uh, if they don't even know who, whether they're boys or girls, they really are going to have a hard time searching for their identity. The second commandment of the women's liberation movement is that we must promote equality at the expense of justice. Now, equality is a very beautiful word. We pride ourselves on being equal under the law, and in many aspects, we are equal. We all have freedom of speech and press and religion, trial by jury, due process, in all those areas. But in other areas, we do not treat people equally. And it would be grievously unfair to treat them equally. We treat people differently when, in fact, they are different. Look, for example, at the differences of treatment on the basis of age. You can vote when you're 18. If you could not discriminate on the basis of age, you would have to let children vote down into the cradle. You get your American citizenship the day you're born. But we think that it's good to have a cutoff age for people who vote. Look at Social Security. That's highly discriminatory. Social Security pays cash benefits to people over age 62 that people under age 62 cannot get. Why? Because we think this promotes the greater goal of social justice, to treat people unequally. Likewise, in the matter of income level, do you think it would be fair to make everybody pay the same income tax, regardless of your income? Most people don't. You not only pay a different tax, you pay a different rate of income tax based on your income level. If you could not treat people differently based on income level, you couldn't have any welfare, any housing benefits, any government scholarships. All of these aspects of our society in which we try to lend a helping hand to certain people, when in fact they are different and need differences of treatment. Now, there are two basic differences between men and women, the women's liberation movement to the contrary notwithstanding. Women have babies and men don't have babies, and women simply do not have the same physical strength as men. The latest report of the Air Force Surgeon General said that their experience is that women have only 60% of the physical strength of men. Now, based on these differences between men and women, we have certain laws that do allow differences of treatment. For example, take the law regarding the draft and the military. We had a draft law for 33 years of this century. That draft law always read, male citizens of age 18 must register. Now, if we accept this notion of the Equal Rights Amendment, in which everybody must be treated equally based on sex. If we put this into the United States Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land, then the next time we reinstate the draft for the next war, that law must read persons of age 18, must register. But that's not the end of it. All the laws pertaining to the draft, to the military, and to war must likewise be sex equal. The laws today which exempt women from military combat are based on obvious sex differences between males and females. But in the Equal Rights Amendment, there are no exceptions. They defeated all exceptions. It says you must treat them equally on a basis of sex. And so women would have to be put into combat just like men. During World War II, which some of us can remember, we drafted fathers and put them in combat up through age 35. Under the Equal Rights Amendment, mothers would have to be equally treated because you would not be able to discriminate or to make any difference of treatment based on sex. 
And this is what the Equal Rights Amendment would require. Now, there are certain people who want that result, but I would suggest that most people don't want that result. We've been through nine wars over 200 years, and the American people have never felt that we wanted to put our young women into combat just like men. They don't want it. And yet this would be one of the inescapable facts that would result from the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Look at the matter of how the Equal Rights Amendment will affect state laws. The, the laws of all the 50 states uh, say that the husband must provide the financial support for his wife. These are good laws. These are laws which give to the wife her right to be a full-time homemaker. Laws which establish the obligation of the husband and father to provide the financial support of his family. These laws are designed to keep the family together, to give the baby a mother in the home. They're good laws. Ah, but they're not sex equal. If we have it in our Constitution that you can never make any law that has a difference of treatment based on sex, all those laws must become sex equal. They cannot have a difference of treatment. Now what will ERA do to the law that says the husband must support his wife? I asked that question of the leading legal light who is uh, for the Equal Rights Amendment, Professor Thomas Emerson of Yale, and he said it will change the law so that the obligation is equal or reciprocal or mutual and each will have the obligation to support each other if he or she is incapacitated. Well, I said to him, Professor Emerson, I'm a homemaker and I'm not incapacitated. And he just said, that's right, you're not. Now you think about that. When is a wife incapacitated? Only the week after she has a baby? They put you out of the hospital now after five days. And all those other years of her married life, she's lost her right to be supported. That right to be supported then is reduced to only the time in her life when she's incapacitated or about to go on welfare. Is that what we want? That's what the women's liberation movement want, wants. They want a gender-free society. They want absolute equality of treatment. The women will be the big loser, the tremendous loser on that. What the Equal Rights Amendment will do is to require us to neutralize all of our federal and state laws and regulations. And the women will lose every time. The third commandment of the women's liberation movement is that you must give women the benefit of reverse discrimination. In other words, they want quotas, particularly in the job market. They want the less well-qualified woman to be hired in preference to the more qualified man in recognition of injustices or discriminations of past years. Now this is a very important social problem to see whether the American people want to do this. I think to give women quotas in the job market like that and to give the less well qualified woman the job preference is very much like, as pointed out by Professor Sidney Hook, saying that because women once didn't have the right to vote in this country, today we should give women two votes and take the vote away from some of the men. Uh, giving the preference to a woman today does absolutely no good for the woman who may truly have been discriminated against 25 or 50 years ago. Beyond that, it is an attack on the economic integrity of the family. What it does is promote a society where you have more and more two-income families and more and more no-income families. As the husband and father who's out of a job and looking for a job can't get it because the preference has been given to the woman in the matter of awarding the jobs. Now there are today 40 million wives who are being supported by their husbands. Do we want to induce any significant percentage of these 40 million wives to leave their homes and go into the job market? Several million of them have done that in the last few years and we have the highest unemployment that we've had in many, many years. Do we want to induce the rest of them to go out of the homes? Do we want to tell all those husbands, maybe you've been supporting your wife up to now, but that's not your obligation anymore? I'll tell you what I think will happen if that Equal Rights Amendment goes through and the husbands and the wives find out that that's, uh, they have no more legal rights to be supported in the home. I think they will voluntarily go into the job market. I think they will go in by the millions in order to build up some job seniority. Is this what we want to induce as a matter of social policy? 
I don't think it is. The fourth commandment of the women's liberation movement is that we must promote uniformity rather than diversity. This is the federalization of every part of our society that hasn't already been federalized. This is what they would accomplish through Section 2 of the Equal Rights Amendment, which says Congress will have the power to enforce it. Now, whatever Congress has the power to enforce, that means it will be administered by the federal bureaus, and it means that the decisions, the controversies, will be decided in the federal courts and ultimately by the Supreme Court. This is what the women's liberation movement is proposing. This is what they want. And this is why the biggest push for the Equal Rights Amendment comes from the federal government, from the people on the federal payroll, who see an ERA a means of extending their power, building more staff, having more money to spend in order to control our lives and restructure our society the way they think it ought to be run instead of ours. This is what they are doing not only through lobbyists working right out of the White House, but also through the Commission on International Women's Year. This is the agency that was given $5 million, supposedly to uh, put on women's conferences in every state, and then finally a national one. But of course, once this group got its hands on the money, they used it in pursuit of the narrow special interest goals of the women's liberation movement. The very first meeting they had, they passed an official resolution unanimously resolving to pass the Equal Rights Amendment at the earliest opportunity and as their highest priority, and resolving, quote, to do all in our capacity to see that ERA is ratified at the earliest possible moment. Now, when you have $5 million to spend, all in your capacity is quite a lot indeed. And this money has been used as uh, simply uh, the personal private money of the women's liberation movement. All their leaders are on the commission. They set up all of their staff, their state committees, their national commission, everything with uh, practically all persons who were for the Equal Rights Amendment. They went through uh, these state conferences, most of which were rigged so that their delegates were elected. And they passed their radical uh, measures, their radical resolutions in most of the state conferences. They look upon this as a charade to go through all the motions, ultimately pass the same radical resolutions in Houston, and then tell Congress and the state legislatures, this is what American women want. And it is, this is not what American women want. Uh, this is simply going through the motions of uh, approving the resolutions that they already wrote a year ago. They all decided in their published book called To Form a More Perfect Union a year and a half ago what the conferences were going to discover. And when you examine their, their resolutions that were passed by most of the state conferences, you see that whatever problem they discuss, the solution is more federal control and more federal funding. It doesn't make any difference whether the problem is a woman being widowed, a woman being beaten by her husband, uh, a woman not being able to have somebody take care of her child, or whatever. Whatever problem they can talk about, the only solution is to give Big Brother in Washington more money, more power, set up a new agency, have more staff, and tell us what our solution should be. And that is how they are a they are promoting uniformity in the treatment of all problems. Now, the great genius of our society is that we do have our 50 states with certain variations. I'm glad they don't have the high tax. I'm glad we don't have in our state the high taxes they have in a few others. I'm glad we don't have wide open gambling like they do in some states. Uh, I'm glad that there are these differences. That's our form of government. We just don't believe that all wisdom comes out of Washington and that uh, all decisions should be made there. One of the areas that has still traditionally been held at the state level is the area of marriage and divorce laws. What in the world would we gain by moving this whole new jurisdiction to the federal government and saying we should have a national HEW divorce law? Does this promote social justice? In our legislature this year, we spent three months hammering out a new divorce law. 
If we don't like it, then next year we can modify it and change it. But once all this moves into the hands of the federal government, your chances of having any input in it are really nil. The fifth commandment of the women's liberation movement is that we must be neutral as between morality and immorality. And you will find that this is a thread running through all of what they do. A major goal of their movement is to establish the homosexuals and the lesbians as just as respectable, just as entitled to uh, rights and privileges under our system as husbands and wives. Uh, most of the state legislatures of the IWI conferences passed resolutions demanding the right of lesbians to teach in the schools and to adopt children. This is a major goal of their movement. Uh, they also want uh, to prevent the schools from taking any action or dismissing any teacher, not only if she's a lesbian, but even if she's having an illegitimate baby, or uh, whether she's having an abortion, or whatever. It, it makes no difference. You can't make any moral judgment on people. They call that sex discrimination. They even got it into the regulations under Title IX, under the Education Amendments of 1972, that uh, it is sex discrimination if you don't pay for an abortion for a teacher or a student if your school or college has a medical plan. Now, nobody but a women's liberationist could think that was sex discrimination, but they do. And it's part of this overall policy that we must be neutral as between morality and immorality. I think this is, is breeding a new type of social disorder. I think it is uh, promoting a, a new type of narcissism, and it is an attack on the family as the basic unit of our society. The women's liberation philosophy is basically terribly negative. If you listen to some of their speeches and read their literature, you will come to the conclusion, as Midge Dechter did, that the women's liberation movement literature is the biggest put down of women that you could possibly imagine. Their line runs like this, sister, when you wake up in the morning, the cards are stacked against you. You won't get a job because people don't like to hire women, and if you do get a job, it won't be a very good one, and you won't get promoted because you might get married and have children, and uh, you won't be well treated, you won't get as much money, and then if you get married, your husband will treat you like a servant, and the home is just a prison, and marriage is nothing but dirty diapers and dirty dishes. And after they read all this, it's no wonder they have psychological problems. It's, it's this uh, whole negative attitude toward life. You should wake up in the morning being glad and proud that you live in the greatest country in the world, where you have such great opportunities, where, where our unique combination of, uh, of social and political and economic institutions has given us the greatest freedom that any country has ever had, the greatest prosperity that er any country has ever had. Now, if you go into marriage and the family, it is true, you have to make certain social compromises in order to make that marriage work. But most people think it's worth those social compromises. A mother does have to be a self-sacrificing person. And if you're not willing to make those sacrifices, it's very difficult to bring up good children. The really the very saddest thing I see as I go about the country is when I go to the college campuses. And the biggest thing that hits you on the college campuses today is that the young women are not planning on having any babies. They've taken some women's studies courses, and they've been fed the line that of all the goals and careers and that women should look for in this life, being a wife and mother has got to be the last, that they should go into any other type of career. And the peer pressure for career fulfillment to the exclusion of marriage and homemaking is powerful on the college campuses today. All you have to do is look at the fall in the birth rate and you see what has happened. And the more years that young women spend in college, the fewer babies they're having. Uh, well, uh, some of them may not find out how, how much fun it is to have a family, but at any rate, uh, unfortunately, they have been fed so much of this from their women's studies courses uh, that I think they are passing up great opportunities for fulfillment. A couple of years ago, the uh, NBC network put on a three-hour production called Of Women and Men, 
It aired on January 9, 1975. It was a three-hour special which showed the lifestyle, the morals, the religion, the male-female relationships promoted by the advocates of the sex revolution, the permissive world, women's liberation, and the proponents of the Equal Rights Amendment. Those of you who remember it, I'm sure you know that in this entire three-hour production, there was not one single voice for monogamous lifetime marriage. There was not a voice for the family unit as the basic unit of our society. There was not a voice for motherhood as a fulfilling career or for the Ten Commandments as a code of conduct. That just didn't, simply did not exist in the world of the future in the male-female relationships. This was a tremendous media production to promote the world of sex without marriage. And they had it all there, from the high schoolers in their vans with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in the back, through to the senior citizens in the, their 70s who were doing all the same thing. And Barbara Walters and her co-anchor person assured us that the world of what they call serial marriage is coming fast and should be welcomed. And it was all shown as beautiful. Of course, when they show all this, they don't show the social costs. They don't show that venereal disease is at epidemic proportions at the present time. They don't show that abortion is our third most popular operation. They don't show the loneliness of divorce. They don't show the wrecked lives of people living without commitment to God or his commandments. They don't tell them that what you're missing without the joy of knowing that God is in his heaven, we have a great country, you can face life's problems and build a great future for yourself with the particular mix of, of uh, handicaps and assets that each of us come into this life with. The women's liberation movement is making a determined attack on the moral values, on the institution of the family, and I think those women who attended the conferences of International Women's Year have realized that the values you cherish, the world that you know, is threatened today and you are needed to come and to defend those values and those institutions. You are needed to fight the battle in the schools, on the media, in your community, and the state capitol, and in the Congress. You are needed because People have to speak up in defense of these values, in defense of things that a few years ago you would have not thought necessary that were needed to defend. But they do need you today. Reminds me of the story that my good friend Senator Everett Dirksen told all up and down our state about the man who wanted to give his wife an anniversary present. And she had always wanted to have a parrot. And so he went to the bird store and he looked over the supply and he selected a very fine one that said all kinds of smart sayings, paid $25 for it in the days when $25 bought a pretty good bird, told the clerk to uh, package it up and send it out to his wife. And in due course the husband came home from work and she greeted him at the door all smiles and he said, did you get my anniversary present? And she said, I certainly did. It's in the oven. It'll be ready at 6 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, the husband said, how could you do that? That was a very smart bird. It was a parrot. It could say all sorts of things. And the wife said, well, if it was such a smart bird, why didn't it speak up? <laughs> so that is our task, to speak up, to speak up for the values that built our great country and that can build a future generation that can carry on the values we cherish. There was a great French philosopher who traveled the length and breadth of our country in the last century named Alexis de Tocqueville. And when he came to the end of his travels, he made a conclusion, which I think is pertinent today. He said, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and ample rivers, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness of America in her fertile lands and boundless prairies, and it was not there. It was not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness that I realized the genius of her greatness and her power. America is great because she is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. 
This is our challenge, and we need your dedication to the task. Thank you. Should the House of Representatives decide that the length of time may be extended on the ratification, would that rescind all of the ratifications that have been made up to this time? The Equal Rights Amendment, when it came out of Congress on March 22, 1972, had in its resolving clause uh, whereas a Senate and House, uh, two-thirds of each House concurring, uh, do proclaim this constitutional amendment, it shall be valid as part of the Constitution if ratified by three-fourths of the states within seven years from the date of passage. And then followed the three sections that you already know. Now, 35 states ratified, three of those rescinded. Nebraska, Tennessee, and Idaho. Only one state has ratified in the last two years, and that was only because of direct interference from the White House. ERA is due to run out on the deadline of March 22, 1979. As an act of desperation, the proponents who see they're not getting their amendment have gone into Congress with a bill and ask to have the time extended another seven years. Now, we believe this is unconstitutional and illegal, and it invalidates all the preceding ratifications. This is a simple application of contract law. If you offer to sell your house to two people, providing they accept by Tuesday, and one accepts on Tuesday, and one accepts on Wednesday, that Wednesday acceptance does not bind the sale. The Tuesday acceptor and you have got to re-offer the deal. And therefore, we think that the states that ratified under the old rules cannot be bound to states that ratified under the new rules. So I'm hoping that this uh, motion, which is so clearly unfair, will be defeated by the Congress. And I would ask you to urge your Ohio congressmen and senators to vote against it and reject it. But in the event that it passes, I would hope that you would go to your legislators and have them reaffirm that they ratified under the old rules, and that simply doesn't bind them over to the new rules. The whole thing is really very much a change of the rules in the middle of the game. It is exactly like a, f a losing football team demanding that a fifth quarter be played to give them time to catch up. Now, the b fans on either side would not put up with that type of unfairness. And I am encouraged at the large numbers of people who have spoken out in the last week who are for the Equal Rights Amendment who just can't stomach this unfair, unprecedented, unrealistic attempt to change the rules in the middle of the game. So I hope you will let your legislators, your congressmen, your senators know you want them to vote no. Okay. Your book has alerted mothers to the drastic changes in the school textbooks. Could you give us some idea how we can handle this type of change? Because two, three years is a lot in a little child's life, and we can't wait 15 years for these things to reverse. It is a, a very difficult question when you come up against the rules. Uh, you're now facing the changes in the textbooks that I mentioned. You are also facing rules that come down from HEW uh, mandating uh, co-ed everything. And I'm getting complaints every week from mothers and even from children uh, 
who don't like uh, the co-ed sports, the co-ed gym that they're being put together in. Now you have one example of what you can do. When HEW issued its rule that you could no longer have mother-daughter, father-son school events, there was a big uproar. And uh, that uh, rule was issued in Arizona, and it was kind of like a minor explosion out there. And uh, then President Ford got in the act, and he said this is the most ridiculous thing he ever heard, and ultimately Congress passed a quickie amendment that exempted mother-daughter, father-son events. We're kind of having the same fight now on the, on the glee clubs and the choir. They want to make everything co-ed. And uh, there are certain areas where if you get the uh, parents and and uh, make it known that you do not want this type of uh, education, you can have an effect too. Thank you. Mrs. Shafley, I'd like to thank you very much for coming to Cincinnati and I'd like to ask as a uh, younger person who is looking forward to getting married sometime in the future, I would, uh, I would like you, if you could, to just uh, maybe give a few words of advice to uh, a future wife if she's looking on, as I'm sure she would be. Well, I'll tell you the same things I tell my sons. If you're interested in a girl, you better just find out whether she's planning on having any babies. Because babies are uh, the great benefit that men get out of marriage. Get somebody to carry on your name. Of course, the women's livers think that's a terrible indignity. Uh, but you better find out first. And uh, I do think that uh, homemaking is a very fulfilling career for a woman. And the great thing about the world we live in, that women can have it every way, coming and going. It's, a, it's the great uh, opportunity. That's why I wrote my book, The Power of the Positive Woman. She can build her life. Now, if a woman takes 20 years out to mother her growing family, as, as I did, you're not going to be at the same career slot at age 50 as a man who spent 60 hours a week building his career. But what you've got is better, I think. But even if you don't think it's better, you, you could have your choice any way you want. But you shouldn't cry around and complain that it's discrimination when you've got the opportunity to do it any way you want it. So I think the uh, women really have no complaint. They have every opportunity. But as a young man, you better find out what her goals and aspirations are before you get locked in. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, International Women's Year, IWY, is going to have its national conference in November. Is that going to be the end of IWY and its influence on our lives? Oh, I wish I knew, but I, I have never yet known any government agency that self-destructed. They always come back for more money, and they've been pretty quiet about it lately. Now, they haven't yet made their proposal because we have shown so many examples of the illegalities, the steamroller tactics, the parliamentary shenanigans, the outrageous treatment of our people, that they've been lying a bit low. Uh, but I'm sure they'll go on. They, they are trying to promote it through the UN. They're, they've got money for the UN International Women's uh, Year. Oh, they're talking about decade now. They must be going to come back for more money if they're talking about International Women's Decade. But what we should do is to let people know what actually went on at these conferences. Most of them passed the resolutions, and the bottom line of what they're for is ERA, government-funded abortion, federal child care, universally available, lesbian privileges to enable them to teach in the schools and adopt children, and reverse discrimination to get women in the jobs. Now, in addition to that, there's a variety of other goals which varied from state to state such as they want to eliminate veterans' preference, they want to um, take the money out of national defense and put it in women's lib. In our state, they passed a resolution specifically to take the money out of the B-1 and put it into a women's lib taxpayer-financed advocate at every level of government so she can make sure the women are getting their jobs instead of the men. And, um, uh, they have other goals. They want to give away the Panama Canal. And you didn't know that was a woman's issue, did you? But that's another goal of the International Women's Year. And to top it all off in our state, they passed a resolution to abolish Robert's Rules of Order. He's a male chauvinist pig. 
So I think you should, you should all find out what their goals are. Look at the face of it. This is not what the American people want. Yeah. Yeah. We see a number of men promoting ERA. Would you explain how these men are going to benefit? Well, I really don't think any, anybody's going to benefit unless it's a man who wants to get out of his obligation, such as getting out of the draft or getting out of supporting his wife and children. And I really think that that type of man is in a small minority. But I don't see, uh, if, if you've got a man who really uh, wants, to, wants to have a family and be a stable citizen and is patriotic and so forth, uh, I just don't think they're going to benefit at all. I don't see any affirmative case for ERA. It's, it's really the biggest fraud that ever came down the pike. It doesn't do good things. It doesn't give new rights or benefits or opportunities. Mrs. Schlafly, she really asked the question I wanted to know, what, how this would affect men. But seeing as she asked it, I'll ask another one. Mm -hmm. Where do we get your book? The oh, my new book is called The Power of the Positive Woman. And I hope it's available in your bookstores. Uh, but if it isn't, you can order it directly from me. It's uh, $8.95. And if you give me a slip with your name on it today, I'll, I'll send you a copy with uh, an autograph and a bill. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Shafley, I'd like to find out what areas of foreign policy that International Women's Year wants to affect. Well, the uh, National Commission in this country hasn't gone too much into that, except in the area of cutting back on national defense and abolishing veterans' preference. And uh, but the, when they met in Mexico City in 1975, they did adopt a whole lot of areas. And I remember specifically that giving away the Panama Canal was one of their goals. So, and you can see the effect that uh, this movement is having. You may think they're just a bunch of screaming women, but they're very persistent. And it does take people like you to uh, speak up for the other side. Well, I do know that in the state of Ohio that the workshop passed a uh, resolution that they wanted disarmament under unilateral control and also to support the new international economic order. And yes, I well, I'm not surprised. That fits in. They passed resolutions in our state uh, just really to take all the funding out of national defense. I don't know why they're that way, but there it is. You didn't know that was a woman's issue. But their, their scope of, uh, of goals is really uh, uh, quite broad and I think it's very detrimental to uh, what the majority of people in this country want. I think you should also realize how really stacked this Commission on International Women's Year is. When the President appointed the National Commission, 42, 41 out of 42 were pro-ERA. And they include all the leaders of the women's liberation movement. They have the head of the National Organization for Women, the head of the Women's Political Caucus, the head of the Lesbian Task Force, the head of ER America, the lobbying organization, Gloria Steinem, Bell Abzug is the chairman, Martha Griffiths, they're all in it. And then they set up their state, co their state coordinating committees. And they ran at the ratio, like in Illinois, of 58 pro-ERA to one token con. They didn't know she was against. That's the only reason she got on. Then they set up their staff. To the best of our knowledge, every staff person at the federal or state level in any state was pro-ERA, not a single one against. Then they stacked their programs. In 50 state conferences, in the general sessions, there was nobody against ERA who spoke at any general session. Then they had the workshops, which are the smaller meetings at these conferences. They ran at the ratio of about 100 pro-ERA to one con. They didn't have any genuine debate. If they had a workshop on abortion, it's not pro-abortion and con-abortion. It's four different ways of how do we implement abortion and force it on everybody. Uh, then, they, uh, then they fixed up ways to elect their delegates to Houston. Now, I know that in, in Ohio, you were able to elect a great many of your pro-family delegates. But in most states, the elections were so rigged that there was no way to do it. And the typical tactic was, as in our state, our candidates were not permitted to have their representatives watch the counting of the ballots. 
I don't know how familiar you are with elections, but I do not think there is any such thing as a fair election if you do not permit candidates to watch the counting of the ballots. And that is what we were denied and denied in most states. In Florida, although our people had two-thirds of those there at all times, we couldn't elect a majority of the delegates because they would not let our people nominate more than 13 out of 40 candidates. Uh, they wouldn't permit further nominations. They wouldn't allow us to appeal from the chair to the floor. They wouldn't permit write-ins and uh, repeatedly would allow no appeal from the chair to the floor. And so when it all died down, we had only 13 out of 40 delegates, although we had a clear established two-thirds majority of people there. Now, with that type of tactic, they elected a big majority of the delegates to go to Houston. Then after that was all done, it then appeared that the National Commission could name an additional 400 at large of their choice just to make sure they had a big majority. So they will have about 80 percent of the delegates in Houston, and they will pass these resolutions. Now, the way they got the resolutions through, they, uh, in some cases, was by locking our people out of the hall such as in Kansas, there, although there were, I think, 3,500 people who paid their $2 registration, they locked about 1,000 of them out and said the fire marshal wouldn't let any more in. The day after the conference closed, it, we discovered that the actual capacity of the room was 5,600. So by such devices as that, they got their pro-radical, anti-family, pro-lesbian resolutions passed. And so we can expect that they'll go through all these motions at Houston. The important thing is that we show that this is not what American women want. And I don't believe they want it. And you can help in, in many ways that are available to you by registering your complaint with your congressmen, your legislators, signing petitions, et cetera. Yes. Uh, uh, Mrs. Shafley. Um, We've dealt an awful lot with women and women's rights, but there's something that really comes through to me in your book, The Power of the Positive Women, and it's the effect of, of uh, ERA and the IWI on men. Could you go into more detail on that and show the adverse, uh, more adverse things of how this really comes around through the back door and really hits the men uh, and hurts them? Well, I think that the men will suffer very much with any attack on the family unit. We have, dis we have already covered a few of these points. Uh, the matter of the, uh, the discrimination against men in jobs, in hiring and promotions. Uh, the matter of their not being able to, uh, uh, their wives not wanting any, any babies. Um, the women's liberation movement considers such laws or regulations as those that require the child to carry his father's name name, uh, or which allow the husband to establish the family domicile. Uh, they, those are special targets of the women's liberation movement, and they would fall under the Equal Rights Amendment. And those are some of the rights uh, that accrue to the men, uh, which they would lose under this movement. Uh, the uh, veterans preference is another area. The women's liberation movement hates veterans. They are out in every way to eliminate the veterans preference. I think if a man goes off and defends our country at the risk of his life, he's entitled to some little preference at getting a job. But I'll give you an example of, of how this this comes home. I did a talk show in Chicago and some woman called in and didn't like what I said and she said, uh, I work at the steel mill in Gary and I'm getting 18000 a year and uh, my husband, uh, I'm getting more than my husband, he's getting 17000 And uh, then it developed in the course of her call in, she's got a six month old baby. Now you think of the social implications of this. In the first place, if you've ever been through a steel mill, uh, it's hard to see how any woman would want that kind of a job, but it's very difficult to, sit, to tell me that she was the most qualified person for that job with all the high unemployment we have of available men. Now, it's not a matter of need that she's working. If she's making 18000 and he's making 17000 this isn't need. This is because she wants the money and taking it. Then she's got the baby, and she is exactly the type of woman who comes along and says, well, the government's got to provide a child care center because the mother's working. And then you consider the consequence on the man who's trying to support his family who didn't get the job that she got. So the social implications of this are tremendous. And uh, I think...